the Galactic Academy's main atrium hummed with the low murmur of countless species, all gathered beneath the grand dome that soared toward the distant stars. The space was a marvel of architecture, blending organic shapes with technological elegance. Bioluminescent panels cast a soft glow, reflecting off the polished surfaces and the faces of those who had come to learn. It was a place where the galaxy's brightest minds met an institution designed to foster cooperation and understanding between worlds. Students from planets with peaceful histories mingled freely, their conversations forming a tapestry of sound. Here, the air was thick with hope and ambition, a shared belief that the galaxy could come together, transcending the barriers of language, culture, and history. In the midst of it all stood Leon Harding, a solitary figure leaning against one of the polished columns. His earth-made boots scuffed the pristine floor, an unconscious act of defiance in a place that valued decorum. He felt a strange mixture of pride and discomfort. As the first human admitted into the academy, he was a curiosity, an oddity. His species, emerging from a planet classified as a death world, was something of a galactic anomaly, Earth known for its deadly ecosystems and volatile environments, was a world most civilized species wouldn't dare set foot on. Leon scratched the back of his neck, feeling the weight of countless eyes upon him. He had never been much for big gatherings. They drained his energy. But the academy required all new students to attend the orientation, a necessary rite of passage. As he observed the crowd, Leon felt the thrumming of his heart in his ears, Laughter erupted from a group of Thalerans, their sleek amphibian bodies glimmering under the atrium's lights. Nearby, a pair of Chirolians with vibrant plumage flitted about, their voices a melodious blend of clicks and whistles. In stark contrast, Leon felt like a shadow amidst a kaleidoscope of color and culture. It wasn't long before a group of alien students noticed him, their conversations fading as they threw glances in his direction. Their curiosity was palpable, an unspoken question hanging in the air. Who was this human? One, a Varnaxian with sleek, iridescent carapace armor, broke from the group and approached. The creature's mandibles clicked rhythmically, its four slender limbs moving gracefully. Leon braced himself, half expecting hostility. Human, the Varnaxian said, its voice a series of clicks and hisses that translated into words. We have heard much about your world. Leon raised an eyebrow, already sensing the condescension in the insectoid's tone. Yeah? What's that? He leaned forward slightly, feigning nonchalance. The Varnaxian's antennae twitched as it spoke. They say it's a place of constant death. Predators, natural disasters, your own species always fighting, always killing. We find it fascinating. Leon crossed his arms, a smirk tugging at the corner of his mouth. That about sums it up. We're a tough bunch. The other students nearby, a mix of Thalerans and Chirolians, listened intently. The Thaleran, a sleek amphibian with silvery skin, let out a low gurgling sound that translated into a chuckle. Surely it's not that bad. I mean, how do you survive in such a place? Leon tilted his head, his eyes glinting with amusement. Survive? You don't survive on Earth. You adapt, you endure, and sometimes you just hope to make it through the day without becoming something's dinner. The Varnaxian's mandibles clicked again, this time more agitated. Exaggeration, surely. No world could be that hostile and still produce intelligent life. Leon's smile widened, the corner of his mouth twitching up in mischief. You think I'm exaggerating? He pushed himself off the column. Stepping into the circle of curious aliens, let me tell you a story. The crowd leaned in, interest peaked. Leon cleared his throat, drawing on memories of his childhood. Once upon a time, on a planet called Earth, there lived a species that thrived against all odds. We call it the Black Sky. The atmosphere shifted as he began to weave his tale, his voice steady and engaging. In a time long before the stars aligned for peace, Earth was a battleground. Warring factions, desperate for resources and power, fought endlessly against one another. The air was thick with smoke, and the ground shook beneath the weight of conflict. Imagine, if you will, cities reduced to ruins and landscapes scarred by violence. 
A shiver of intrigue passed through the group, their eyes wide, absorbing the imagery. The Varnaxian leaned in closer, its mandibles clicking softly. Leon continued, but amidst this chaos, there was a village a place where survivors gathered, united by the will to endure. They were not warriors, but farmers and artisans, and they had something the warring factions lacked, hope. This village became a sanctuary, a stark contrast to the destruction surrounding it. Hope? The Thaloran gurgled. What good is hope in a world of violence? Leon's expression turned serious. Hope is a powerful weapon. It drives people to act, to fight for a future worth living. The villagers worked together, pooling their resources and knowledge. They learned to defend themselves, not with brute force, but through clever strategies. As Leon spoke, he gestured animatedly, drawing his audience into the world he was creating. They crafted traps and barriers, designed to outsmart the marauding factions. When raiders attacked, the villagers didn't meet them head-on. They used the terrain to their advantage, turning the land into a weapon. The raiders, expecting an easy victory, found themselves ensnared by their own arrogance. Clever, the Varnaxian interjected, its interest visibly piqued. And what happened next? Leon grinned, relishing the engagement. Word of their tactics spread, and soon other villages sought refuge in their strategy. This was no longer just a fight for survival. It became a movement. The villagers inspired others to resist the violence that plagued the land. They built alliances, sharing resources and knowledge, fostering a sense of community. The Chirolians exchanged glances, their feathers ruffling in excitement. And then they won, one chirped. Not quite, Leon replied, shaking his head. Victory wasn't guaranteed. There were losses, heartbreaks, and moments of despair. But through every setback, they learned and adapted. They became resilient. Eventually, they faced a massive onslaught from a coalition of raiders determined to crush this new hope. What did they do? Jamie, one of the Thalerans, asked eagerly. They fought back, Leon answered, the weight of his words sinking in. But it wasn't just with weapons. They employed every tactic they had learned. The villagers used decoys, distractions, and guerrilla warfare. It was a battle of wits as much as it was a battle of strength. In the end, the raiders underestimated the spirit of the villagers. Did they win? The anticipation was electric in the air. Leon paused, letting the tension build. They did. But it wasn't a clean victory. The price was high. Many lives were lost, and the land bore scars that would take generations to heal. But they stood firm, united, and through their perseverance, they forged a new beginning. As he concluded, Leon let the silence settle, watching the reactions of his audience. The Varnaxian appeared thoughtful, its antennae swaying gently. So, the moral is... Leon smiled, his voice rich with conviction. The moral is that in the darkest times, hope can flourish. Humanity has faced unimaginable odds, but it's our ability to adapt and work together that allows us to endure. Every tale of survival on Earth echoes this truth. Suddenly, the atmosphere shifted again, a low thrumming sound resonating through the atrium. A holographic display flickered to life above them, the dome with swirling star maps and images of various worlds. A figure appeared a tall, dignified being with shimmering skin that seemed to shift colors. Welcome, esteemed students. The figure's voice was melodic, commanding attention. I am Professor Zyreel, and I will guide you through the next phase of your orientation. Leon felt a ripple of excitement through the crowd. Looks like we're in for more, he whispered to Jamie, who grinned in response. Professor Zyreel continued, We will now delve into the cultures and histories of the diverse species represented here at the Academy. You have much to learn from one another. The galaxy thrives on cooperation, and understanding one another's stories is the first step. The surrounding students leaned in slightly, their interest piqued. Leon gestured for them to sit as he took a seat on a nearby bench. More students gathered around, drawn by the growing tension in the air. This happened a few years ago, back when I was just a kid, Leon began, his tone casual. 
but with an undercurrent of tension that immediately grabbed their attention. My family used to go camping deep in one of Earth's forests. It was supposed to be a fun trip, you know? Get away from the city, spend time in nature. The Thalaran's gills fluttered, clearly confused by the concept. You willingly went into the wilderness? Sure did, Leon said, eyes glinting with a dark humor. But Earth's wilderness isn't like your world's. It's unpredictable, filled with predators that can smell weakness from miles away. The crowd grew quieter as Leon leaned forward, lowering his voice. That night, I woke up to the sound of rustling outside our tent. At first, I thought it was just the wind. But then I heard it this low, guttural growl. Something big was circling the campsite. The Varnaxian shifted uncomfortably, its antennae twitching nervously. What was it? Wolves, Leon said flatly, pausing for effect. A pack of them. They're some of Earth's apex predators hunters that rely on teamwork to bring down prey much larger than themselves. But it wasn't just the wolves that were dangerous. It was the way they moved, the way they communicated. Silent, calculated. They didn't rush in like mindless beasts. They waited, watching for an opening. One of the Chirolians, a massive, lumbering figure with thick gray skin, rumbled. How did you fight them off? Leon grinned, though there was no warmth in it. That's the thing. You don't fight wolves. You outthink them. My dad, he always told me in the wild. It's not about who's stronger, it's about who's smarter. So, I grabbed the closest thing I could find an old flare gun we kept in the tent for emergencies. The crowd leaned in, hanging on his every word. When they finally charged, I fired the flare straight into the air. The wolves scattered, blinded by the sudden light. It wasn't enough to scare them off for good, but it bought us time. We didn't sleep much that night. We just sat by the fire, waiting, listening to their howls in the dark. Leon's voice trailed off, letting the weight of the story settle over the group. The Thalaran blinked, eyes wide. That sounds horrifying. Leon shrugged. That's Earth for you. You either adapt, or you end up as something's next meal. The Varnaxian clicked its mandibles nervously. That, that cannot be the norm, can it? Surely not all of your people live in such danger. Leon chuckled. Oh, that was nothing. Just a taste of what Earth has to offer. Wait until I tell you about the time I was caught in the middle of a wildfire. The group exchanged uneasy glances, and for the first time, Leon saw a flicker of real fear in their eyes. He knew they were starting to realize Earth wasn't just some backwater planet. It was a place that forged its inhabitants into something more than just survivors. It turned them into predators in their own right. As Leon leaned back, a small crowd of onlookers had gathered. Word of his tales was spreading, and with each story he told, he could feel their perceptions shifting. No longer was he just the odd human from a death world. He was becoming something else in their eyes, something far more dangerous. By the time the next day's classes rolled around, Leon could feel the shift in the atmosphere. He was no longer just the human he was the human the one who came from a planet where death lurked around every corner. His classmates' gazes lingered longer than usual, some filled with curiosity, others with thinly veiled apprehension. Even the professors seemed slightly wary now, their normally smooth tones occasionally faltering when they glanced his way. Leon didn't mind. If anything, it made him chuckle. He wasn't here to make friends and if a few stories about Earth's darker corners kept him from having to deal with endless questions about humanity, all the better. After the last class, a few students gathered around him in the courtyard, eager for another tale. He pretended not to notice them at first, staring up at the towering spires of the academy, which gleamed under the twin suns of the planet. It was so peaceful here too peaceful. No predators, no disasters, no constant undercurrent of survival at stake. To Leon, it felt like a hollow kind of perfection. A Thaleran student cautiously approached, his silvery skin shimmering in the fading light. Leon, if it's not too much trouble, he began, gills fluttering nervously. We were hoping you could tell us more about Earth. Leon gave a slow smile, feigning reluctance. You sure about that? 
Last time I told a story, half of you couldn't sleep. The small group exchanged uneasy glances, but no one backed down. Leon sighed theatrically and settled down on a bench, gesturing for the others to sit around him. By now, even students from other species had caught wind of his stories, and a few Varnaxians, Chirolians, and Zedrians filtered into the circle. All right, but remember, you asked for it, Leon said, his voice dropping to a lower, more sinister register. This one's about one of Earth's oldest enemies. Not animals, not the environment, though those are dangerous enough. This one's about our own people. The students exchanged curious looks, not sure what to expect. Leon leaned forward, his eyes narrowing. This story takes place in a city called Titan's Reach. It was once a massive metropolis, filled with towering buildings, bustling trade, and millions of people. But everything changed when a rival faction, hungry for power, decided to seize control. The city became a battleground overnight. Humans fought each other? One of the Chirolians rumbled, confused. Why would they destroy their own? Power, Leon said simply. Sometimes, people will do anything for it, even turn against their own kind. And that's exactly what happened. Titan's reach became a war zone. Civilians were trapped in the middle, caught between warring factions, as the city itself began to crumble around them. The crowd was silent now, their attention fully on Leon. I was just a kid then, Leon continued, his voice taking on a reflective tone. We lived on the outskirts, where the fighting hadn't reached. But one day, a convoy of soldiers came through, dragging families out of their homes, saying we had to evacuate. They told us it was for our own safety, but we knew better. They wanted the land strategic ground for their next assault. Leon paused, letting the tension build. My father wasn't a soldier, but he wasn't about to let some army take our home. He gathered the rest of the families and told them we'd fight. Not with guns or bombs, we didn't have those. We'd fight using the land itself. Guerrilla tactics. The students leaned in, intrigued. Leon could see the doubt in their eyes. They couldn't understand how unarmed civilians could stand a chance against a military force. But they didn't know humans like he did. We dug tunnels beneath the forest, set traps, ambushed supply lines. It was slow work, dangerous, but we knew the terrain better than they did. The soldiers couldn't move through the trees without us knowing. Every time they sent a patrol, we'd pick them off one by one, without a sound. A Varnaxian clicked its mandibles in disbelief. And this worked? Leon's smile didn't reach his eyes. For a while, but then they brought in their heavy machinery. Tanks, drones, airstrikes. They leveled half the forest trying to root us out. That's when we realized we couldn't win by hiding. He paused, scanning the faces around him, letting the weight of his words sink in. So we did the only thing left. We lured them into the ruins of the old city, into Titan's reach itself. The place was a death trap by then. Buildings barely standing, debris everywhere. We knew the layout, but they didn't. It was like hunting in a maze, and we became the predators. Leon's voice grew darker as he described the final days of the battle. We rigged entire buildings to collapse on top of their troops, used the city's infrastructure against them. Every alleyway became an ambush point, every street a kill zone. They thought they were hunting us, but we were leading them to their own deaths. The group of students was dead silent now hanging on every word. Even the Thalaran, who had been so dismissive before, seemed pale, his skin dimming to a dull gray. By the end of it, the army withdrew, Leon continued. They lost too many men, and the city wasn't worth the price anymore. But Titan's reach, it was gone. Nothing left but ruins. We may have survived, but the city didn't. He leaned back, letting the story settle over the group. For a moment, no one spoke, the gravity of the tale sinking in. Leon watched their reactions closely, noticing how even the bravest among them seemed shaken. Finally, one of the Zedrians, a slender, bipedal creature with translucent skin, broke the silence. Your species is ruthless. To turn a city into a trap, to use such methods. Leon shrugged. 
You do what you have to when your survival's on the line. Earth's not a place for the faint of heart. The Chirolian rumbled again, deep and slow. It seems to me that Earth is not just dangerous because of its environment. Your people, you are dangerous as well. Leon didn't deny it. We had to become that way. A death world doesn't just shape the land, it shapes the people too. You either learn to adapt, to think on your feet, or you don't make it. The group was still processing his words when a familiar voice interrupted the gathering. It was Professor Rise, a Zedrian who had been watching from a distance. He stepped forward, his tone curious but cautious. Leon, the professor said, his thin, alien mouth curling into what might have been a smile. Perhaps you could share more of these stories with the class. I think it would be an educational experience for the others. Leon chuckled softly, rising to his feet. Oh, I've got plenty more where that came from. As he walked away, leaving the group of students and the professor behind, Leon couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. They weren't just curious about Earth anymore. They were afraid, and that was just the way he liked it. Leon's reputation spread like wildfire. Every student he passed in the halls of the academy now gave him a wide berth, their faces a mix of wariness and awe. He had only shared a couple of stories, but already the whispers began Deathworlder, Survivor, Warrior. His classmates feared him, but they couldn't stay away. Curiosity gnawed at them, a hunger they couldn't quite suppress. A week later, during one of the Academy's rest periods, the inevitable happened. A small group gathered in the common room, mostly Zedrians and a few Thalarans, all of them lounging around in the Academy's plush seating. It was a rare moment of leisure in a place otherwise devoted to intense study. Leon had been minding his own business, reading over a survival tactics manual from one of the galactic libraries, most of which he found laughably useless. The creatures of other worlds had no concept of true survival. They thought danger was a malfunctioning droid or an unexpected solar storm. They hadn't lived on a world where the planet itself tried to kill you at every turn. One of the Thalarans, a hulking figure named Boric, approached him. His broad, webbed feet padded softly against the metallic floor as his gills flared nervously. Leon, Boric began, his tone far more respectful than it had been the first time. The others and I, we were wondering if you might have another story, one from Earth. Leon raised an eyebrow, pretending to be surprised. He let the silence stretch for a moment, savoring the discomfort in the air. You sure? Leon asked looking over at the gathered students. I don't think you're ready for what Earth really has to offer. Boric swallowed hard, his gills fluttering. We can handle it. After all, we're learning about survival here, right? What better way than to hear about it from a Deathworlder? Leon smiled, leaning back in his chair. He was no longer reading. Now, he was fully engaged. He could tell they needed the rush, the thrill of hearing something that would rattle their peaceful, predictable lives. And Leon was more than happy to oblige. All right, then, he said, setting the manual aside. You want a story? I'll tell you about one of Earth's most terrifying places, the Arctic Wastes. Several of the students leaned forward, intrigued. Others, like Boric, looked confused. The Arctic Wastes? Boric asked, cocking his head. That doesn't sound very dangerous. Leon grinned. Trust me, it is. Picture this. Temperatures so cold they can freeze your skin solid in minutes. Wind that cuts through you like knives, turning your breath into ice crystals. And worst of all, the land itself. Endless ice, where the ground can crack open beneath you, swallowing you whole into the freezing abyss. Nothing grows there. Nothing survives there, except us. The room fell silent, even the sound of the Academy's air filtration system seemed to fade into the background as Leon's words sunk in. How did your people survive such conditions? asked Azedrian, her glassy, translucent skin reflecting the faint glow of the room's lights. Surely no creature could endure that for long. That's the thing, Leon replied, his voice steady and serious. Most don't. The Arctic isn't just a place, it's a test a test of endurance, of cunning, of pure willpower. 
Every step you take up there could be your last. If the cold doesn't kill you, the predators might. The Thalarin's gills flared again, the word predators piquing his interest. Predators? Even in such a hostile environment? Leon chuckled. Oh yeah, Earth's got some of the deadliest predators you can imagine, and they don't care how cold it gets. In fact, they thrive in it. Take the polar bear, for example. It's one of the largest land predators on Earth, weighing over 1 in 500 pounds. You won't see them coming, not until it's too late. Their white fur blends in perfectly with the snow. One moment, you're trudging through the ice, and the next. Leon slammed his hand down on the table, startling everyone. Your dinner. The students recoiled, some with nervous laughter, others with genuine fear in their eyes. But the predators aren't the only thing to worry about, Leon continued, his tone growing darker. The cold messes with your mind. You start seeing things shadows that aren't there, movement in the corner of your eye. Sometimes it's just the wind playing tricks. Other times it's the ice shifting beneath you, ready to crack open and drag you down into freezing water so cold it'll stop your heart in seconds. A Varnaxian, sitting quietly at the back, spoke up. His chitinous exoskeleton clicked as he shifted uneasily. And yet, your people choose to live there. Leon's expression became unreadable. We don't choose it. But sometimes, survival doesn't give you a choice. There are remote outposts up there, research stations, oil drills, and military bases. People go because they have to. Because Earth always demands a price. The room fell into a deep, contemplative silence, each student grappling with the idea of a place where survival was a daily battle, where death could strike without warning. Leon let the moment linger, watching their reactions. But it wasn't long before another student, this time a Cairolian with jagged, crystalline skin, broke the silence. And you, Leon? the Cairolian asked in a gravelly voice. Have you been to this Arctic yourself? Leon's gaze hardened. Yeah, I have. The room seemed to shrink as the other students leaned in even closer, eager for more. I was part of a survival training mission when I was younger, Leon explained, his voice now tinged with something colder, more personal. Our goal was simple, make it through two weeks in the Arctic, cut off from civilization, with nothing but basic gear. The first few days were rough, but manageable. We found shelter, rationed our food, stayed close together to conserve body heat. But then, on the fourth night, Leon paused, letting the tension build we lost someone. The Thalaran's gills fluttered again. Lost? To what? Still don't know, Leon said softly, his voice carrying a note of sadness. One of the guys his name was Eric wandered off during the night. We thought maybe he'd gone to relieve himself, but after an hour, he still hadn't come back. We searched for him for hours, combing the ice, calling his name. But there was no trace. No tracks, no signs of struggle. It was like the ice swallowed him whole. The Zedrian shifted uncomfortably, her translucent skin dimming slightly. And you never found him. Leon shook his head. Not a trace. By the time the mission ended, the search was called off. We had no choice but to leave. But I'll never forget the look in his eyes before he disappeared like he knew something was coming. Something we couldn't see. The room fell into a heavy silence and Leon could see the discomfort in their faces. For a moment, even the Thalarans, known for their resilience and strength, seemed unsettled. That's Earth for you, Leon said quietly, a place where even the strongest can vanish without a trace. No one's safe not from the cold, not from the land, and not from what lives in the shadows. With that, Leon stood up, leaving the group to sit in their silence the weight of his words pressing down on them like the arctic winds. He didn't need to stay to know that the seed of fear had already taken root in their minds. After that day, Leon noticed a shift in the academy's atmosphere. His classmates didn't just avoid him anymore. They seemed genuinely afraid. And yet, there was always a new face waiting at the edge of a group, someone who hadn't heard the stories yet or someone who had, but still craved more. It was like an addiction a dangerous game of curiosity versus survival instinct. 
The teachers never commented on the growing tension. They were accustomed to various species coexisting with their quirks and differences, but none of them had prepared for a human, a death worlder, to unsettle their students so profoundly. Leon's next tale wasn't planned. He was in the academy's gym, a high-tech facility filled with holographic training dummies and gravity manipulation machines designed to accommodate all species. His workout regimen was intense, even by human standards. Earth-born gravity, muscle fatigue, and cardiovascular endurance were all far greater than most species expected, and Leon made sure to keep his edge. As he was finishing a set of strength training, lifting weights that would crush a thalerin or splinter as Edrian's brittle limbs, a small crowd began to gather. This time, they didn't wait for a formal invitation. Leon. The voice came from a Zandari, an insectoid race known for their sharp wit and curiosity. It was Kaoris, one of the few who hadn't directly interacted with Leon since his arrival, but had observed him from a distance. What is it? Leon grunted, lowering the massive barbell back onto its stand. His muscles ached, and sweat glistened on his skin, but he was nowhere near finished. Kaoris hesitated, his mandibles clicking softly. We were talking about Earth again. The others said you faced predators before, actual creatures that hunt and kill humans. Leon grabbed a towel and wiped his brow, his eyes narrowing at the Zandari's request. He wasn't surprised that the fascination with Earth had turned toward its wildlife. To most of these students, their homeworlds were relatively tame harsh in their own ways, but not hostile, not like Earth. Predators, huh? Leon muttered, draping the towel over his shoulders. You want to know what hunts humans? Kairos's mandibles clicked faster, a sign of nervous excitement. Yes, we're curious about what kind of creatures could pose a threat to your kind. You're known for being resilient. Leon chuckled, but there was no humor in it. Resilient doesn't mean invincible. Earth has plenty of creatures that could end you in seconds if you're not careful. He could see the interest flare in the crowd that had gathered Zedrians, Thalerans, Chirolians, even a couple of Varnaxians. They were all waiting for him to speak. And so, he did. Let me tell you about the Amazon. The name itself seemed to have no meaning for them, which only fueled their curiosity further. The Amazon is a jungle, Leon explained. A massive one covering millions of square kilometers of land. It's so thick with trees and vegetation that sunlight barely reaches the ground in some places. But what makes it dangerous isn't the plants, it's the animals, the predators. Kairis tilted his head. What kind of predators? Leon took a deep breath, recalling the dangers that lurked within the Amazon's dense foliage. He had never faced them directly, but he'd been trained to respect their power, their cunning. They were nature's perfect killers. Jaguars, he began, locking eyes with the crowd. Massive cats, capable of blending into the shadows so well that you won't see them until it's too late. They're strong enough to crush a human skull with a single bite. Several of the students shuddered at the thought, their imaginations painting vivid pictures of these unseen killers lurking in the dark. But that's not the worst of it, Leon continued, his tone darkening. The jungle itself is alive poisonous plants, venomous insects, parasitic organisms that can burrow into your skin and lay eggs inside your body. You could be walking along, thinking you're safe, and then, you're infected, and you wouldn't even know it until it's too late. A Chirolian's crystalline skin shimmered uneasily. Infected? What do you mean? Leon smirked, enjoying the tension building in the room. There's a parasite called Kandaroo. It's a tiny fish, no bigger than a finger, but it's notorious for one thing it swims into your body through any opening it can find. Once it's inside, it latches on and starts feeding. Imagine that a creature living inside you, eating you from the inside out. Gasps of horror spread through the group. Even KRS, who had been so eager to hear about Earth's dangers, recoiled at the thought. Humans have ways of dealing with these threats, Leon added, but the jungle doesn't care about our technology, our intelligence. It's raw, primal. It's a place where even the most advanced weapons won't save you if you're not prepared. 
The Thalaran, Boric, who had heard Leon's previous stories, couldn't contain his disbelief. But surely you don't go into such places willingly? Why would your people even live near such death zones? Leon's eyes grew distant, as though he were recalling something deeply personal. Sometimes, we don't have a choice. Earth has cities, technology, and safe zones, but it's not like the planets you're used to. No matter where you go, there's danger. Whether it's in the depths of the Amazon, the frozen tundras of the Arctic, or the vast deserts where the sun can cook you alive, we're always fighting to survive. Always. A heavy silence fell over the room, the weight of Leon's words pressing down on everyone. But then, one of the Chiroleans, a younger student with shimmering, violet crystals embedded in his skin, spoke up. How, how do you live with that, knowing that death is always so close? Leon looked at him, his gaze hard and unyielding. You don't have a choice. You adapt or you die. That's the way of Earth. For a long moment, no one said anything. The students shifted uncomfortably, exchanging nervous glances, unsure of how to respond. They had come to the academy to learn survival, to face challenges they thought were insurmountable. But nothing they had experienced, nothing they had trained for, compared to what Leon described. Earth was a place of nightmares, a world where survival was a daily battle. And yet, Leon was standing there living proof that it could be done. That humans, despite everything, could endure. Chaos broke the silence, his mandibles clicking thoughtfully. You're an anomaly, Leon. No other species has lived through what you describe. It's hard to comprehend how your kind can thrive on such a world. Leon didn't respond immediately. Instead, he wiped the sweat from his brow and slung the towel over his shoulder, looking out at the group with a steely gaze. We thrive, he said slowly, because we have to. That's what it means to be human. Earth teaches you that the only way to survive is to fight back, no matter how hard the odds are, and that's why we'll always be stronger than you think. With that, he turned and walked away, leaving the students in stunned silence once more. He didn't need to see their faces to know what they were thinking. He had given them a glimpse of Earth, just a taste of what it meant to survive on a death world. And they were terrified. Leon's reputation had spread beyond his immediate class. The Academy was a nexus of species, a melting pot where knowledge, tactics, and combat training were shared between the most advanced civilizations. But now, in every corner, hushed whispers about the death worlder could be heard. Even the instructor's beings that had seen war and conflict spanning the galaxy cast cautious glances his way. His stories were taking on a life of their own. Exaggerated, embellished, and mutated versions of his tales circulated through the academy, making him seem almost mythical. But Leon didn't care. He didn't live for their approval or fear. Still, there was one group that hadn't been drawn in by his stories, the Zuluan. The Zuluan were an enigmatic, predatory species from the rim of the galaxy, cold-blooded and reptilian. Their planet's harsh deserts and volcanic storms had forged them into some of the most formidable warriors in the universe. They were a proud race, known for their physical prowess, cunning, and merciless tactics. Leon had encountered a few of them in the Academy's halls, but they always held themselves apart, uninterested in the growing intrigue surrounding Earth and its human inhabitants until one day. It started as a normal afternoon. Leon was on his way to the mess hall, where the academy served up an array of cuisine meant to accommodate every species. As he walked through the wide corridors, a few students moved aside, giving him space. They weren't afraid of him directly most were simply wary of the tension his presence created. But today was different. Standing in the middle of the hallway, blocking his path, were three Zuluan warriors, their scaled bodies gleamed under the artificial lights, and their piercing yellow eyes were fixed on him with unblinking intensity. The leader of the group, who Leon recognized as Jaller, stepped forward. He was taller than Leon by at least a foot, his body rippling with muscle, and his black and red scales shimmered as he moved. His voice was a low, menacing hiss. Deathworlder, he said, the word dripping with disdain. Leon stopped in his tracks, his eyes narrowing. What do you want, Joller? 
The Zuluan's lipless mouth twisted into something resembling a smile. I've heard your stories. Earth, the death world, where you humans claim to survive against all odds. But I have to wonder, he leaned in closer, his slitted pupils narrowing. Are they just stories, or are you really as dangerous as they say? Leon crossed his arms, standing his ground. You looking to find out? Jaller let out a sharp, hissing laugh. I've faced warriors from every corner of the galaxy. I've fought in the blood pits of Gazrak and wrestled the storm beasts of Marak. Your tales sound like children's nightmares compared to what I've seen. Leon smirked, unfazed by the Zuluan's bravado. Then you haven't been to Earth. The tension between them crackled in the air, drawing the attention of other students who had been passing by. A crowd began to gather, sensing that something was about to go down. Jaller tilted his head, his yellow eyes gleaming with malice. You speak of Earth like it's a trial by fire, but I think you've grown soft here, Deathworlder. Tell me, what's the worst creature you've faced? Surely it can't compare to the beasts of my homeworld. Leon's eyes hardened. He wasn't in the mood for a pissing contest, but the Zuluan's arrogance grated on him. He had faced things on Earth that made even the most advanced civilization shudder, and he didn't need to prove himself, but maybe it was time the Zuluan learned just how dangerous Earth really was. You want a story? Leon asked, his voice calm but edged with steel. I'll give you one. The crowd around them grew, and even the Zuluan warriors' postures stiffened as they prepared to hear whatever Leon had to offer. There's a place on Earth, Leon began, his voice carrying over the murmurs of the crowd. It's called the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of our oceans. It's so deep that the pressure alone could crush a human into paste. But that's not the real danger. Down there, in the dark, there are creatures that shouldn't exist. Things that have adapted to live in complete darkness, in conditions that would kill just about anything else in the galaxy. Jaller's smirk faltered slightly, but he said nothing waiting for Leon to continue. One of those creatures is called the giant squid, Leon said, his eyes locking with Jollers. A predator that grows up to 40 feet long, with tentacles covered in hooks that latch onto prey and tear it apart. And here's the best part. Humans have gone down there. We've built machines that can withstand the pressure, and we've faced those monsters. We've fought them. Leon's voice grew quieter, more intense. We've fought things on our planet that you can't even imagine. We've survived because we had to, because Earth doesn't care if you're smart or strong or fast. Earth doesn't play by the rules, and neither do we. For a moment, there was silence. The crowd hung on his every word, and even the Zuluan warriors seemed unsettled by the intensity of Leon's tone. But Jaller wasn't ready to back down. You speak of deep oceans and strange beasts, Jaller hissed his yellow eyes flashing. But what does that matter here? You're in the academy now, far from your death world. All your stories, all your tales, they mean nothing here. Leon didn't blink. You think Earth's just a collection of scary animals and bad weather? You don't get it. Earth isn't just dangerous because of what lives there. It's dangerous because it made us. We're the product of millions of years of evolution, of surviving on a world that wants to kill us every day and that's what you're dealing with. You think you're tough because you fought in blood pits and wrestled storm beasts? Fine, but we fight for our survival every single day. That's what makes us different. Jaller's smile disappeared entirely. For the first time, the Zuluan warrior looked uncertain. Leon could see it in his eyes, the realization that maybe, just maybe, he had underestimated the human standing before him. Before Jaller could respond, Leon stepped closer, his voice low but full of menace. I've told you my stories, Jaller, but if you really want to know what a Deathworlder can do, you'll find out when you push me too far. The crowd was dead silent, watching the two of them face off. Jaller's chest rose and fell, his breath coming quicker now. His comrades behind him shifted uneasily, their predatory instincts picking up on the sudden shift in the atmosphere. Something had changed. This wasn't just about stories anymore. After what felt like an eternity, Jaller stepped back, his gaze never leaving Leon's. He didn't speak, didn't offer a retort. 
Instead, he simply turned and motioned for his fellow Zuluan to follow him. One by one, they slinked away, their pride bruised, but their survival instincts intact. The crowd dispersed shortly after, leaving Leon standing alone in the hallway. He could feel the weight of what had just happened, the unspoken victory that came not from strength, but from the raw, unrelenting truth of what it meant to be human. As Leon resumed his walk to the mess hall, he couldn't help but smile. For all their bluster and bravado, the Zuluan had learned something important that day. Earth wasn't just a death world. It was a crucible, and humans were its finest creation. The tension following the confrontation with the Zuluan didn't fade quickly. Word spread through the academy like wildfire, and whispers followed Leon everywhere. The reputation of the Death Worlder had escalated into something larger than life. Even species that prided themselves on their logical and analytical natures were unnerved by the cold, unshakable confidence Leon had displayed. Still, the Academy carried on with its strict schedule of training, studies, and simulations. Leon found himself spending more time alone, not because he wasn't welcome in groups, but because the others gave him a wide berth cautious of provoking the human whose stories blurred the line between myth and reality. It wasn't long before his solitude was interrupted. As Leon was heading to one of his evening study sessions in the Academy's vast library, a figure appeared at his side. It was a new face, one Leon didn't recognize immediately a tall, willowy alien with translucent skin that shimmered like oil under the soft lights. The being's eyes were large, almost amphibious, and its slender fingers tapped lightly against its side as it walked beside him. Leon of Earth? The alien's voice was soft but resonant, with a strangely melodic quality. Leon raised an eyebrow, but didn't stop walking. Yeah, who's asking? The alien offered a graceful nod. My name is Chiral, from the Andros faction. We've been observing you. Observing me? Leon asked feeling a slight prick of curiosity. Chiral's strange eyes blinked slowly, almost as if considering its next words carefully. Indeed, your presence here has caused quite the shift in the academy, and not just among your peers. Certain factions, like mine, have become intrigued by the stories you tell. There are many who want to understand the full extent of human resilience. Leon sighed internally. He had been expecting this, as much as some found his stories terrifying, there were always those who wanted to peel back the layers, to dig deeper into what made humans tick. He wasn't exactly thrilled by the idea of being a science project. And what does your faction want with me, Chiral? Leon asked, his voice edged with suspicion. Chiral's mouth curved into something resembling a smile, though its facial structure made it hard to tell. Nothing so sinister. We merely wish to hear more. The tales of Earth, your death world, are beyond anything we have ever encountered. We would be honored if you would share another story with us, a different one this time. Leon stopped walking and studied Cairo closely. It was clear the Andros wasn't just making a casual request. There was intent behind this a deeper, more calculated motive. But Leon had faced worse dangers than curious aliens. If Chiral wanted another story, Leon would oblige. Fine, Leon said, leaning back against the smooth, cool wall of the corridor. You want a different story? How about one from the other end of Earth's spectrum? Not deep oceans or monsters, but something more insidious. Chiral nodded, its eyes never wavering from Leon's. This one's about a place called Siberia, Leon began, his voice lowering as if sharing a dark secret a frozen wasteland that stretches for thousands of miles. It's one of the coldest places on Earth, where temperatures drop so low that even your breath can freeze in the air. The ground is permafrost ice-covered Earth that never thaws. But here's the thing about Siberia. It hides something beneath that frozen ground. Something old, and something dangerous. Chiral's eyes widened slightly, its curiosity peaked. Back in the early days of human exploration, we didn't know much about the diseases that could survive in extreme conditions. But as our technology advanced, we started drilling deeper into the permafrost, searching for resources. That's when we uncovered it, the pithivirus. 
an ancient virus that had been trapped in the ice for over 30,000 years. Leon could see Chiral's interest growing. Alien or not, everyone understood the primal fear of disease. The pithavirus was something we thought extinct, harmless, we assumed, but as it thawed in our labs, it awoke, and what followed was a lesson in humility for humanity. You see, we've conquered space, developed medicine that cures once deadly illnesses, and built cities that stretch into the clouds. But we're not invincible, not even close. Leon's expression darkened. The virus spread faster than we anticipated, attacking the immune systems of the scientists who were closest to it. There was no warning, no time to prepare. Within days, the infected were isolated, and a global quarantine was enforced. Panic set in. The pithavirus wasn't just killing, it was mutating. Our strongest antiviral treatments couldn't stop it. Chiral's breathing slowed, its gaze fixed entirely on Leon. The alien, for all its calculated control, seemed unnerved by the story's sudden turn. Leon continued, his voice a chilling whisper now. But we humans have a way of surviving, no matter how dire the situation. In our darkest hour, when everything seems lost, we innovate. We adapted. The quarantine was brutal, but effective, and we discovered the virus had a weakness heat. It couldn't survive outside the cold, so we burned it out. Literally. We used flamethrowers, radiation, anything to sterilize the infected zones. We lost a lot of people in the process, but that's Earth for you. Sometimes, the only way to survive is through fire. Leon stopped letting the weight of his words sink in. Chiral was silent, processing the implications of what it had just heard. Finally, it spoke, its voice softer now. Your world, it is truly a place of extremes. Leon nodded. You have no idea. The Andros bowed its head slightly. I thank you for your story, Leon of Earth. It has given me much to consider. Without another word, Chiral turned and glided away its shimmering form disappearing into the labyrinth of the Academy. Leon watched it go, feeling the familiar weight of his planet's legacy settle on his shoulders. Earth wasn't just a death world, it was a crucible of extremes, where life and death were constantly at war, and survival was never guaranteed. As he continued his walk to the library, Leon couldn't help but wonder how long it would be before the Academy, in its quest for understanding, pushed him too far. The next day, Leon found the academy buzzing even more than usual. As he entered the central training hub, he felt the stairs following him, whispers darting between clusters of students and instructors. The Andros must have shared his tale, spreading it like wildfire. He had half expected this after Chiral's reaction, there was no way the story of Siberia's ancient plague would stay confined to just one listener. Leon, wait up. He turned to see Marlek one of the few classmates who seemed unfazed by his stories. Marlek was a thick-set, broad-shouldered Urkthal, a species known for their brute strength and warrior culture. He was one of the rare few who wasn't afraid to spar with Leon during training sessions. Marlek jogged over, his usual grin plastered across his face. So, words out that you scared the crap out of the Andros last night with one of your Earth stories? Something about ancient viruses and frozen wastelands? Leon shrugged, not breaking stride. It wasn't my goal to scare them, but yeah, I told Chiral a story. Marlek chuckled, shaking his head. I swear, every time you open your mouth, half the academy starts questioning their own survival instincts. Anyway, listen, I've been thinking. You've got all these tales of Earth that no one else has. Stories that mess with people's heads. But how do we know they're all true? Leon stopped walking and glanced sideways at Marlek. Are you calling me a liar? Marlek's grin only widened. Nah, man. I'm saying I want proof. Spar with me. Show me what a deathworlder can really do, outside of stories. A few other students within earshot turned to listen, intrigued by the challenge. A few of them nudged each other, eager to see how this would play out. Leon sighed. Sparring with Marlek was always a challenge, but now it was going to be a spectacle. All right, Leon said, rolling his shoulders. Let's do it. The training grounds were crowded as usual, 
with simulations and physical drills happening simultaneously, Leon and Marlek found an open space near the edge, surrounded by padded walls and a dozen sets of curious eyes. It wasn't long before a few others stopped their training to watch, forming a loose circle around them. As they squared off, Leon felt the familiar adrenaline kick in. Sparring with an Urkthal was like fighting a walking tank. They were larger, stronger, and built for close combat. But humans had their own advantages. The instructor overseeing the grounds nodded for them to begin. No weapons, just hand to hand. Marlek moved first, fast for his size, his massive arms swinging in a wide arc meant to catch Leon by surprise. But Leon ducked, rolling to the side, his feet light on the ground. As he straightened up, he was already calculating Marlek's next move. The Urkful lunged forward, aiming to grapple Leon, using his bulk to force him into submission. Leon sidestepped again, but this time, Marlek was ready. A quick swipe of his legs sent Leon tumbling back, and before he could recover, Marlek had him pinned against the padded wall. Gotcha, Marlek grunted, his heavy forearm pressing against Leon's chest. Leon grinned, his muscles tensing. You think so? In one swift movement, Leon hooked his leg behind Marlek's knee, using the Urkthal's momentum against him. With a sharp twist, Leon flipped them both, reversing their positions and slamming Marlek onto his back with a loud thud. A murmur rippled through the onlookers. Marlek blinked in surprise, the wind knocked out of him for a moment. Leon didn't let up. He pressed his advantage, pinning Marlek's arm behind his back and planting a knee against his shoulder blade. Still think it's all just stories? Marlek grunted in pain, but managed to chuckle. All right, all right, I yield. Leon released him and stepped back, offering a hand to help Marlek to his feet. The Urkful took it, shaking his head in disbelief. Damn, Deathworlders really don't play around, huh? Leon shrugged, brushing off the dust. Earth doesn't give you much of a choice. The crowd dispersed, a few of them whispering amongst themselves, clearly impressed by what they'd just witnessed. Leon noticed some of the more skeptical students giving him a new kind of respect, though whether it was admiration or fear, he couldn't tell. As Leon caught his breath, another figure approached an instructor this time. Instructor Rigel was one of the Academy's veterans, a member of the Circulian race with a wiry build and four arms that always seemed in motion, even when he was standing still. Impressive, Leon, Rigel said, his voice like gravel. You've been making waves here, not just with your stories, but now with your physical prowess. The Academy doesn't normally condone extracurricular sparring, but I must admit, your skills are intriguing. Leon wiped the sweat from his brow. Just keeping sharp, instructor. Rigel's eyes narrowed slightly. Perhaps, but there's more to it than that, isn't there? You've proven that you're more than just a storyteller. The students talk about your tales as if they're legends, but legends have a way of growing out of proportion. Leon felt a twinge of annoyance. He knew where this was going. What are you getting at? I've heard of your stories, Leon, about Earth's beasts, your planet's harsh environments, and now your tales of ancient plagues. But there's one story I haven't heard from you yet. Rigel leaned in slightly. Why are you really here at the Academy? Leon frowned. It wasn't the first time someone had asked him this, but the intensity in Rigel's voice made him hesitate. His admission into the academy had always felt more like an experiment than an invitation. He had been handpicked, one of the first humans to attend, but the reason behind that selection was shrouded in mystery, even to him. Same reason as everyone else, Leon said evenly. To learn, train, and be the best. Rigel's expression didn't change, but his eyes remained locked on Leon's. Perhaps, but I have a feeling there's more to it than that. You carry something with you, Leon of Earth. A weight that the others don't, I'll be watching. With that, Rigel turned and walked away, leaving Leon with a growing sense of unease. What did the instructor know, and why had he singled Leon out? As the day wore on, Leon found himself distracted by Rigel's words. The academy had always been a proving ground, 
but now it felt like something else, a place where secrets were being kept, not just by the instructors, but by the very students who surrounded him. That evening, as Leon returned to his quarters, he couldn't shake the feeling that something bigger was at play. The stories he'd told had painted Earth as a place of danger, of survival, but maybe the real danger wasn't on Earth at all. Maybe it was here, lurking in the shadows of the Academy, waiting to be uncovered. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the Academy grounds, Leon stood before his classmates, a sense of anticipation coursing through him. The last few weeks had transformed him from the outcast, the Death World student, into a storyteller whose words could bridge gaps between cultures. Now, he prepared to dive into a darker chapter of Earth's history, one that would test not only his audience's resilience, but their understanding of humanity's capacity for survival in the face of devastation. Tonight, I want to take you into a story from Earth's not-so-distant past, he began, his voice steady and commanding. It's a tale that speaks of humanity's darkest hours, the tale of the black sky. The room fell silent, the students leaning in closer their expressions a mix of curiosity and apprehension. Leon took a deep breath, recalling the bleak landscape he would describe. Imagine a world ravaged by relentless war, cities reduced to rubble, landscapes poisoned by the very technology that once promised progress. The sky was blackened, choked with ash and the remnants of countless battles. He could see the students' faces shifting, their imaginations ignited by his words. In this world, Two factions arose from the ashes, the scavengers, who thrived on the remnants of the old civilization, and the purists, who believed in a new way of life free from the taint of technology. But survival, my friends, is a complicated game. As he spun the narrative, Leon introduced his characters, Sam, a cunning scavenger leader, and Alex, a fierce purist warrior. Sam was born in the ruins, a street-smart survivor who knew how to navigate the toxic terrain. Alex, on the other hand, was raised in a commune, taught to reject the old ways and embrace a simpler, purer existence. The setting shifted in Leon's mind as he painted a vivid picture. It was a dry, desolate landscape where the air was thick with the stench of decay. The ground was cracked, and any hint of vegetation was twisted and blackened struggling to exist. In this environment, both factions coveted a hidden cache of clean water, an invaluable resource that could tip the balance of power. He paused, letting the tension build. One fateful day, whispers of the cache reached both camps. Sam gathered his loyal band of scavengers, while Alex rallied her purest fighters. They were both driven by desperation, each determined to seize the water and secure their survival. Leon's voice lowered, drawing his audience into the gravity of the impending conflict. The battle commenced at dawn, under a sky heavy with ash. The scavengers, nimble and resourceful, moved stealthily through the debris, using the ruins as cover. The purists, clad in makeshift armor, stood firm, believing their cause was righteous. As the battle unfolded in Leon's narrative, he described ambushes and skirmishes, the chaos of war echoing through the desolation. Sam, quick-witted and strategic, employed guerrilla tactics. He had a knack for outsmarting his enemies, setting traps that exploited their rigidity. While the purists charged forward, their conviction blinding them to the dangers around them, Sam's crew struck from the shadows, taking them by surprise. The crowd was rapt, eyes wide as they envisioned the turmoil. But it wasn't just physical strength that determined the outcome. The environment itself became an adversary. The air grew thicker with toxic fumes, and both sides were forced to adapt. Those who failed to heed the signs of danger paid the price. Leon introduced a critical turning point in the story. Amid the chaos, Alex found herself separated from her unit. In that moment of vulnerability, she was forced to confront her own beliefs. Was survival worth sacrificing her values? As she struggled to navigate the ruins, she stumbled upon one of Sam's traps, a makeshift pit covered in debris. His audience leaned closer, enraptured. Just when it seemed she would fall into the trap, Sam appeared. Instead of finishing her off, he hesitated. He recognized in her eyes the same desperation he felt, the same will to survive. 
What if we work together, he suggested, his voice low but filled with urgency. We both need that water. Let's outsmart our factions together. The tension hung in the air, Leon's voice a whisper as he continued. Alex, torn between duty and survival, considered his offer. She understood that their true enemy wasn't each other, but the toxic world they inhabited, and the very ideologies that had led them to this point. With the battlefield as their backdrop, Leon detailed how they formed an uneasy alliance. They began to strategize, pooling their knowledge of the terrain and their respective factions. Sam taught Alex about stealth, while she shared the purest emphasis on community and collective strength. They set a plan in motion, one that would not only secure the water, but also challenge the foundations of their warring ideologies. As the climactic moment approached, Leon's voice rose, fueled by the urgency of the tale. Together, they devised a ruse that would lead their factions into a trap of their own making. They created illusions, using the environment to their advantage, and for a brief moment, the fighting stopped. Both factions, blinded by their own hatred, turned against the very world that had betrayed them. The atmosphere in the room crackled with tension. The battle raged on, but this time, it was chaos. Amid the chaos, Sam and Alex fought side by side, proving that even in the darkest moments, collaboration could arise from adversity. In the end, they managed to seize the cash, but not without cost. The battlefield was littered with the remnants of both factions, a stark reminder of the futility of their conflict. As Leon concluded, he could see the impact of his story settling over the audience. In the aftermath, Sam and Alex stood amidst the ruins, the black sky overhead a testament to the destruction that had transpired. They realized that survival wasn't merely about securing resources, it was about understanding and adapting to their world and each other. He paused, letting his final words resonate. They chose to forge a new path, one that acknowledged their differences but united them in purpose. Together, they began to rebuild, proving that even in the face of devastation, humanity's potential for growth and cooperation could shine through. The room erupted into applause, a wave of appreciation washing over him. As he soaked in the applause, Leon felt a renewed sense of purpose. He had not only shared a tale of survival, but also a reminder of the importance of understanding and collaboration, even amid adversity. As the applause for his previous story faded, Leon felt the adrenaline still coursing through him. His classmates leaned in, eager for more. He took a moment to collect his thoughts, preparing to dive into yet another gripping tale from Earth's history, one that highlighted humanity's relentless spirit in the face of nature's unforgiving challenges. Tonight, I want to share a story that showcases not just the resilience of humanity, but our primal instincts the tale of survival of the fittest. Leon began, his tone shifting to one of intrigue. It's about an ancient explorer who ventured into the heart of an uncharted jungle, where danger lurked in every shadow and survival hinged on ingenuity and sheer will. The students exchanged glances, captivated by the promise of adventure. Leon painted a vivid image of the jungle, filled with towering trees, thick foliage, and an ecosystem teeming with life and peril. This is not just any jungle, it's a place where every creature, from the smallest insect to the largest predator, has evolved to survive. Our protagonist, a daring human named Marcus, sought the thrill of exploration and the discovery of uncharted lands. He described Marcus's background, a seasoned explorer with a thirst for adventure. Marcus was a man driven by curiosity, armed only with minimal supplies and knife, a small amount of food, and an indomitable spirit. His goal? To navigate the depths of this jungle and uncover its secrets. As Leon narrated, he could see the audience becoming immersed in Marcus's journey. Upon entering the jungle, he was immediately struck by its overwhelming beauty and danger. The air was thick with humidity, and the sounds of wildlife enveloped him chirping insects, rustling leaves, and distant roars that echoed ominously. Yet, he pressed on, driven by the promise of discovery. Where was he headed? One of his classmates called out, curiosity sparkling in her eyes. Good question, Leon replied, adjusting his stance. Marcus had heard tales of a lost city deep in the jungle, 
rumored to be filled with treasures and ancient artifacts. But the real treasure was the journey itself a chance to test his limits against nature. He continued, his voice steady as he delved deeper. As he moved further into the jungle, Marcus encountered his first challenge, a thick wall of vines and thorns blocking his path. He grunted in frustration. What do I do now? He muttered to himself. It's like the jungle wants to keep its secrets. With determination, he began to cut away at the foliage, his hands growing raw. He could hear the calls of unseen creatures, each sound heightening his senses. Stay focused, Marcus, he whispered, reminding himself of the countless explorers who had come before him and failed. Leon's voice took on a more intense tone. After hours of struggle, he finally broke through the dense underbrush, only to be met by a sight that left him in awe a massive waterfall cascading into a crystal-clear pool, surrounded by vibrant flora. Incredible, he breathed, taking in the beauty around him. But the moment of peace was short-lived. As he knelt to drink from the pool, he heard a low growl. His heart raced. What now, he thought, spinning around to face a large jaguar. Its eyes locked on him. You've got to be kidding me. Leon mimicked Marcus's panic, eliciting laughter from his classmates. In that instant, he knew he had to think fast. Instead of running, he slowly backed away, maintaining eye contact with the creature. Easy now, I'm not here to hurt you, he murmured, trying to remain calm, just passing through. The jaguar's gaze softened slightly, and Marcus felt a glimmer of hope. But then it lunged, and in a split second, Marcus was off, darting into the thick underbrush. Think, Marcus, think, he shouted, searching for a place to hide. He quickly climbed a tree, his heart pounding in his ears. As he perched on a sturdy branch, Leon painted the scene vividly. From his vantage point, he could see the jungle teeming with life. The jaguar prowled below, waiting for him to make a move. What a way to start my adventure, he muttered, forcing himself to breathe steadily. I can't let fear take over. With the jaguar circling, Marcus knew he needed to outsmart the predator. He remembered stories of explorers who had used their surroundings to their advantage. If I can't fight it, I'll have to outthink it, he whispered to himself, scanning the area for a distraction. After a moment, an idea struck him. He grabbed a handful of stones and started tossing them away from his hiding place. The jaguar, curious and alert, turned its attention to the sound. That's it. Focus on the noise, Marcus urged quietly, relieved to see the creature leave his immediate vicinity. The audience was enraptured as Leon recounted how Marcus finally made his escape. Once he was sure the jaguar had lost interest, he climbed down and resumed his journey, adrenaline still coursing through his veins. I can't believe I made it out of that one, he chuckled to himself, a mix of relief and exhilaration. But the jungle had more tests in store for him, Leon continued, his voice lowering to a conspiratorial whisper. Days passed, and the weather turned. A torrential rainstorm swept through the jungle, soaking him to the bone. Just what I needed, he groaned, looking up at the darkening sky. A little more drama, please. As the rain poured down, Marcus took shelter beneath a massive tree, his thoughts racing. He remembered the stories of survival he'd read. Stay dry, stay warm, he recited, shivering. But the downpour continued, and he felt the ground beneath him start to give way. I'd be terrified, one student interjected, wide-eyed. Exactly, Leon grinned. Marcus felt the weight of the jungle pressing in on him but he had to remain focused. He gathered fallen branches and debris to create a makeshift shelter, his hands trembling as he worked. I can't let this jungle defeat me, he muttered fiercely. After hours of battling the elements, the storm finally subsided. Exhausted but determined, Marcus stepped out into the aftermath. The jungle looked different transformed. The air was fresh, the colors vibrant, but danger still lurked. I've made it this far, he said to himself, surveying his surroundings. I can't turn back now. Leon continued to weave the tale, introducing a turning point. As Marcus navigated through the drenched landscape, he stumbled upon a group of explorers disheveled and desperate. 
What are you doing here? Marcus asked, eyes wide with surprise. This jungle is unforgiving. One of the explorers, a rugged man named Jake, looked up. We were following rumors of a lost city, but we got lost ourselves, he admitted, his voice laced with exhaustion. We need help. Marcus felt a surge of camaraderie. Together, we can find it. Strength in numbers, right? He suggested, rallying their spirits. Jake nodded, his determination rekindled. Let's work together. I know a few survival tricks that might help. As they forged ahead, Marcus found himself sharing his own knowledge. The jungle teaches us how to survive, he said, reflecting on his journey. We can learn from each other. The group faced numerous trials together crossing rivers filled with dangerous currents, evading snakes, and dealing with a constant threat of predators. Leon added depth to their interactions, showcasing their developing bond. One evening, as they gathered around a small fire, Jake leaned in. You know, Marcus, I've always believed that exploration is about conquering fear, but I'm starting to think it's more about understanding it. Marcus nodded thoughtfully. Fear is a part of survival. It keeps us alert, but it shouldn't control us. We have to face it together. The audience was enthralled as Leon highlighted their teamwork and shared experiences. Through trial and error, they learned to navigate the jungle's dangers. They forged weapons, built stronger shelters, and devised strategies to avoid predators. Each night, they shared stories around the fire, their bond growing deeper. But the tension escalated as they faced a formidable challenge. One fateful day, while exploring a narrow path, they encountered a giant anaconda coiled around a tree. Stay calm, Marcus whispered, gripping his spear tightly. We need to move slowly. The group collectively held their breath as Leon continued. But fear surged as the anaconda lunged at them, its massive body unfurling like a bolt of lightning. Run, Marcus shouted, and they scattered in different directions. In the chaos, Marcus and Jake found themselves cornered the anaconda looming dangerously close. We need a distraction, Jake yelled, panic in his voice. On it, Marcus responded, thinking quickly. He grabbed a branch and swung it at the ground, creating noise. Over here, he shouted, hoping to lure the snake away. The tension was palpable as Leon described the frantic moments that followed. To their surprise, the anaconda diverted its attention and the two men seized the opportunity to escape. Once safe, they regrouped, breathless and wide-eyed. That was too close, Jake exclaimed, leaning against a tree to steady himself. Too close indeed, Marcus agreed, laughter bubbling up amidst the adrenaline. But we did it together. As the days turned into weeks, their resilience shone through. Leon narrated their final days in the jungle. They continued their quest, facing the elements, surviving on their wits, and just when they thought they'd found safety, they discovered a hidden temple, partially covered in vines. Is this the lost city? One student asked, leaning forward. Exactly, Leon replied, excitement in his voice. As they explored the temple, they marveled at the intricate carvings and artifacts, a testament to a civilization long gone. We made it, Marcus breathed, awestruck but their victory was bittersweet. Suddenly, the ground trembled beneath them. What's happening? Jake shouted, fear etched on his face. We need to get out. As the jungle reacted violently to their presence, Marcus and Jake scrambled for the exit, adrenaline fueling their escape. In the chaos, they realized that survival wasn't just about finding treasure, it was about the journey they had shared, the lessons they'd learned, and the bonds they'd forged. Leon concluded with a powerful message. As they emerged from the jungle, battered but alive, Marcus turned to his friends. We didn't just survive, we thrived, he said, a grin spreading across his face. Together, we faced the jungle, and it couldn't break us. The room erupted in applause, the thrill of the story lingering in the air. Leon smiled, feeling a sense of fulfillment. He had not only shared a tale of survival, but also illustrated the power of collaboration and the depths of human resilience. As the applause faded, Leon looked at his classmates, their faces glowing with inspiration. 
Remember, no matter the challenges we face, it is our adaptability and spirit that will guide us through the darkest jungles of life. With that thought echoing in the air, he prepared for the next story, eager to explore the myriad facets of humanity's journey. The applause for survival of the fittest still resonated in the room as Leon stepped back, catching his breath. His classmates leaned in, their eyes wide with anticipation for what was next. Leon felt the thrill of storytelling surging through him again, ready to take them on another journey this time to the frigid, unforgiving landscapes of Earth's frozen tundras. Tonight, I want to share a tale that illustrates not just the physical challenges of survival, but the psychological battles that can drive even the strongest to the brink of madness, he began, his voice taking on a somber tone. This is the story of the Iron Frost. The students sat up straight, intrigued. Leon painted a vivid picture of the tundra, a landscape marked by endless white, piercing winds, and an oppressive silence that could unnerve even the most experienced adventurers. Our protagonists are a group of explorers led by a determined woman named Elena. She's not only a skilled navigator, but also a brilliant scientist, driven by a desire to study the effects of climate change in one of the harshest environments on Earth. As Leon elaborated, he described the team. Three other explorers, each with their own specialties, a seasoned mountaineer named Raj, a survivalist named Tom, and an eager young intern, Jamie, who had never faced such extreme conditions. They set out with high hopes and a truckload of gear, ready to brave the frozen wilderness. But as they ventured deeper into the tundra, they quickly discovered that this was no ordinary expedition. Why were they studying climate change? One student asked curiosity igniting in her eyes. Great question, Leon replied, adjusting his stance. Elena believed that understanding the effects of climate change on the tundra would help shape future policies. But what they didn't anticipate was the ferocity of the elements. As he continued, Leon's tone shifted to reflect the growing tension. Days into their trek, a fierce blizzard swept through, transforming the landscape into a white abyss. Visibility dropped to nearly zero, and the wind howled like a living entity, threatening to swallow them whole. He recounted how the team huddled together in their tent, shivering and anxious. Elena checked the weather reports, her brow furrowed. This storm wasn't predicted, she said, frustration bubbling beneath her calm exterior. We need to wait it out. Wait it out. We'll freeze, Raj snapped, his voice tight with panic. We have to move? or we'll die here. If we don't stick together, we'll definitely die, Elena countered, her voice steady. We need to think this through. Leon's classmates leaned closer, fully engaged as the storm raged outside, mirroring the conflict within the tent. As hours turned into days, supplies dwindled and tension mounted. The endless white outside pressed in on them, a constant reminder of their isolation. Jamie, the young intern, began to show signs of distress. What if we never get out of here, she whispered, her voice trembling. Tom, trying to ease the growing fear, responded, We just have to hold on. We're trained for this. We've faced tough situations before. But as the storm continued, the group's mental states began to fray. The constant howling of the wind became maddening. Raj snapped one night, shouting, I can't take it anymore. I need to see something other than this hell. Elena tried to calm him. We can't afford to make reckless decisions. We need to stay focused and support each other. Support each other? We're stuck in this icebox. Raj's frustration echoed through the cramped space. I'd rather face the storm than sit here and wait to die. Leon's voice grew tense as he described the pivotal moment that shifted their fate. On the fourth day, the blizzard finally began to relent. The team emerged from their tent, eyes squinting against the glaring white. But the relief was short-lived. They realized they were disoriented. The landscape had changed dramatically, landmarks erased by the storm. Which way do we go? Jamie asked, panic creeping into her voice. I don't remember anything. Elena looked around, her heart sinking. We'll have to retrace our steps. Stay close, and whatever happens, we stick together determined, they set out, but the cold was unforgiving. 
it seeped into their bones, each breath a painful reminder of their dire situation. Leon described the biting winds and how the chill gnawed at their spirits. It's just a bit further, Elena encouraged, though her voice was strained. The further they traveled, the more they struggled. As hours passed, exhaustion set in. Raj lagged behind, his face pale. I can't keep going, he gasped, falling to his knees. Just leave me. I can't do this anymore. No, Elena shouted, rushing back to him. We're not leaving anyone behind. You're strong. Raj, you can do this, she offered him her arm, but the weight of despair loomed heavy in the air. Leon noted the shift in the group's dynamics as they faced not just the physical challenges of the tundra, but also the psychological toll. The isolation began to play tricks on their minds. They started hearing things a soft whisper carried by the wind, voices calling them to turn back. Did you hear that? Jamie asked, glancing nervously at the others. It's just the wind, Tom replied, though his voice wavered. Focus on moving forward. But doubts lingered. As night fell, they set up camp, huddled together for warmth. The tension was palpable. What if we never find our way back, Jamie whispered, her eyes glistening with tears. We will, Elena insisted, though uncertainty gnawed at her. We just need to believe in ourselves. As the group battled against despair, Leon wove in moments of camaraderie. In the midst of their struggle, they shared stories of home, of dreams, of what awaited them if they could survive. When this is over, Tom said, I'm going to climb the highest mountain I can find. This tundra will just be a memory. I'm going to make the best hot chocolate ever, Jamie added, giggling through her fear. With marshmallows? But the darkness continued to creep in. As the storm raged on, their food supplies dwindled. Elena had to make a tough choice. We can't continue this way. We need to ration our supplies more strictly. Raj's frustration boiled over again. You're just giving up. We need to find help. We can't just sit here and starve. No one is giving up, Elena snapped back, her voice fierce. We're going to get through this, but we need to think clearly. The conflict reached its peak when, during the darkest night, Raj went missing. Where is he? Tom shouted, fear threading through his voice. He should have been back by now. Elena's heart raced. He must have gone to look for help. We have to find him. They bundled up, stepping into the freezing abyss, calling his name into the howling winds. Raj, Jamie yelled, her voice quaking. But only the wind answered, a chilling reminder of their isolation. As they trekked through the snow, Leon described their desperation. Every moment felt like a lifetime. They were losing hope. What if he's hurt? Jamie cried. What if he's... Stop it, Elena snapped, trying to hold back her own fear. We can't think that way. We'll find him. Just as panic threatened to overtake them, they caught a glimpse of a dark figure ahead. Raj, they shouted, rushing toward him. But as they drew closer, they realized something was off. His eyes were wide, haunted. I, I saw something, he stammered, trembling. What do you mean? Tom asked, confused. It was... Something in the snow. It was watching me. Raj's voice trembled as he recounted his eerie encounter with an unknown entity, a shadow lurking just out of sight. Elena frowned, concern knitting her brow. We're all under stress. It's easy to lose perspective out here. But I swear, it was real, Raj insisted, his voice breaking. Leon felt the tension crackle in the air as the team struggled with their fears. They returned to camp, but the doubt lingered. Was it the cold driving them mad, or was there truly something out there? As the nights dragged on, paranoia settled in. They began to avoid the edges of their camp, convinced that something was watching them. We need to keep moving, Elena urged one day, determination glinting in her eyes. Sitting here will only make it worse. With a shared resolve, they packed up and began their trek once again navigating through the treacherous terrain. Leon described the grueling conditions, the howling wind, and the numbing cold that sought to sap their strength. But hope flickered when they spotted a distant structure, a weathered cabin. There, Jamie shouted, pointing with newfound energy. 
Maybe we can find shelter there. Let's go, Elena commanded, adrenaline surging through them. As they approached the cabin, Leon conveyed their mix of hope and trepidation. They stepped inside, expecting warmth, but instead found a chilling emptiness. The cabin was abandoned, filled with remnants of a long-gone inhabitant faded photographs, old equipment, and an unsettling silence. Is anyone here? Raj called, his voice echoing in the hollow space. Elena stepped further inside, her heart racing. Look for anything useful, she urged. We might find supplies or gear. Tom rummaged through the remnants, finally discovering a stash of dried food. This could save us, he exclaimed, relief flooding his features. But as they gathered supplies, something shifted in the atmosphere. Did you hear that? Jamie whispered, her eyes darting toward the door. Leon's voice took on an ominous tone. Outside, the wind howled, and they felt a presence, as if the tundra itself was alive and watching. Raj's previous warning echoed in their minds. Maybe we shouldn't have come here, Jamie murmured, her fear palpable. Elena shook her head, trying to maintain control. We need to regroup, make a plan. This place could be our salvation or our doom. As they settled in for the night, Leon described the haunting ambience of the cabin. Sleep eluded them, and as shadows danced in the flickering candlelight, they exchanged stories of their fears and hopes. It was a brief moment of camaraderie, but deep down, they each fought their own internal battles. Leon's voice softened as he captured their vulnerability. In the dead of night, Elena awoke to the sound of whispers, barely audible but insistent. She listened, heart racing, convinced the cabin held more secrets than they had realized. Is someone there? she called, but the whispers faded away, leaving only the crackle of the candle. Then it struck, a sound outside a low growl that sent chills down their spines. What was that? Tom whispered, eyes wide with fear. Leon paused for effect, letting the tension build. As they glanced out the window, they were met with a sight that paralyzed them with dread. Shadows moving, grotesque forms flickering in and out of sight, creeping closer. We need to leave, Rod shouted, panic setting in. Now! But Elena, despite her own fear, stood firm. We can't just run into the storm. We need a plan. What plan? We're surrounded. Jamie cried, her voice rising in desperation. We can't stay here. The tension escalated as they faced the darkness outside, uncertainty gnawing at their resolve. Just as they prepared to make a break for it, the shadows lunged, revealing the truth wild wolves, driven mad by hunger and the harsh environment. The students gasped, eyes wide with fear. We can't fight them, Tom shouted. We need to get out. Elena, adrenaline coursing through her, took charge. Follow my lead. We make a run for it, stick together. With hearts pounding, they dashed from the cabin, the wolves hot on their heels. The blizzard whipped around them, a cacophony of wind and howls. They pushed forward, fear propelling them into the frozen unknown. Leon's words painted a vivid picture of their desperate flight. With each step, the frost bit at their skin, but the heat of survival ignited their spirits. They sprinted through the snow, relying on each other to stay focused. Just when they thought hope was lost, a flicker of light appeared in the distance, a search party. There, do you see it? Jamie gasped, pointing toward the approaching figures. Elena shouted, This way! And they raced toward the light, the howls of the wolves fading into the background. Once reunited with the search party, relief flooded through them. They'd made it, but the experience had changed them. Leon concluded the tale with weight. They had faced the frozen tundra and each other, pushing the limits of their humanity. As silence fell in the room, Leon added, In the end, they learned that survival isn't just about the elements or external threats. It's about understanding the darkness within and how to light your way through it. The students erupted into applause, the story lingering in the air like a haunting melody. Leon smiled, exhilarated by their engagement. He had taken them through the depths of human struggle and resilience, and he could feel the impact of his words resonating within them. Remember, he said, his tone steady, 
in our darkest moments, it's our connection to each other that lights the way forward. No matter how cold the world becomes, we can always find warmth in unity. The following days blurred into a mix of training, stories, and growing tensions at the academy. Leon found himself constantly looking over his shoulder, half expecting some hidden agenda to reveal itself. Rigel's ominous words haunted him, stirring an instinctual unease he couldn't shake. As the week progressed, Leon returned to the library, hoping to immerse himself in the vast troves of knowledge the Academy offered. He walked past the shelves, filled with tomes of history, science, and culture from various races. He paused at a section labeled Human Studies Books that chronicled Earth's evolution, wars, and natural wonders. Intrigued, he pulled one out and began flipping through the pages, absorbing tales of resilience that felt oddly familiar. Interesting read, huh? Leon looked up to see a familiar face Chiral, the Andro student who had approached him earlier. The alien's translucent skin shimmered under the library's warm lights, reflecting shades of green and blue. Leon felt a spark of annoyance. He had hoped to find some peace and quiet. Why are you following me? Leon asked, trying to keep his tone casual. Chiral tilted its head, a gesture of curiosity. I'm not following you, Leon. I'm merely interested in what drives a human. Your stories have captivated many of us, and I believe they hold more than just entertainment. Leon folded his arms, skepticism creeping into his posture. And what do you want from me? More stories? Actually, Cairo replied, its voice steady. I want to know the truth behind them. I've studied many races, their histories, their triumphs and failures. But your tales resonate differently. They possess a rawness we lack. Leon contemplated Chiral's words. He had never thought of his stories in that way, more as personal anecdotes than windows into human nature. What makes them so different? Your capacity for darkness and light. You share the terrifying aspects of your world, the dangers and the horrors, but also the strength that comes from overcoming them. That duality is fascinating. A flicker of pride ignited within Leon. It was true. Earth was a place of extremes, and he had faced many of them. It's not all heroism, though. Sometimes, it's just survival. Not everyone makes it out alive. True, Chiral acknowledged. But survival itself is a form of victory. Tell me, do you have another story to share? Something beyond the battles and monsters? Perhaps one of the moments that defines your resilience? Leon hesitated. He hadn't thought much about the quieter moments of his life. I guess I can think of one. Chiral settled onto a nearby seat, its translucent skin glowing with anticipation. This one's about a day in the life of my childhood, Leon began, the memories surfacing vividly. I grew up in a small town near the coast, where the ocean was both a friend and a foe. One summer day, my friends and I decided to go surfing, thinking we could tame the waves like the older kids did. We were too proud to listen to the warnings about the incoming storm. Leon leaned forward, his gaze distant. We paddled out into the surf, laughing and shouting, completely unaware of the danger brewing. The waves were gentle at first, but soon the sky darkened and the ocean turned angry. The storm came out of nowhere, crashing over us with a fury that felt almost alive. Chiral's eyes widened, entranced. We struggled against the tide. I remember feeling helpless as the waves swallowed us one by one. I lost sight of my friends, and for a moment, panic set in. But then, something clicked. I remembered the stories my father told me about the ocean, how to respect it, how to listen to its rhythms. It was about survival, yes, but also understanding. I turned my focus inward, quieting my fear, listening to the water. Leon recalled the sensation of the ocean lifting him, the powerful currents swirling around him. I began to swim back, not against the tide but with it, letting the waves guide me. I focused on the horizon, a sliver of safety. One by one, my friends made it back, too, each of us battered but alive. That day, we learned to respect the ocean, to understand its dual nature. Cairo remained silent for a moment after Leon finished absorbing the depth of the story. You face nature's wrath, yet you emerge stronger. 
your resilience is not just in fighting, it's in understanding and adapting. Leon nodded, appreciating the insight. That's true for a lot of things on Earth. Survival isn't just about brute strength. Sometimes it's about knowing when to fight and when to yield. Cairo's expression shifted, contemplation clear in its eyes. You see, Leon, this is what we're all curious about. Your people thrive on this blend of strength and adaptability. It's something we, as Andros, often struggle to understand. Leon furrowed his brow, intrigued. What do you mean? Chiral hesitated, then continued. We tend to rely on our technologies and collective knowledge, often neglecting the individual spirit that drives you humans. You seem to draw strength from your stories, from your shared experiences. That is something we wish to learn from you. The conversation hung in the air, heavy with possibilities. Leon realized that maybe sharing his stories was about more than just entertaining or terrifying his classmates. Perhaps it was a way to bridge the gaps between their vastly different cultures. As the day wore on, Leon left the library feeling a mix of anticipation and trepidation. The academy was shifting around him. The students, once skeptical, were now intrigued. But with that interest came scrutiny. If they wanted to understand Earth, they would delve deeper into the complexities of what it meant to be human. And as for Leon, he would need to be ready for whatever that might bring. As the days turned into weeks, the dynamic at the academy shifted. Leon found himself at the center of a growing circle of students, eager to hear more of his earthly tales. Each story became an event, drawing a diverse audience from various races, all fascinated by the brutal and beautiful aspects of humanity's existence. The legend of the Deathworld student had taken on a life of its own, and with it came a mix of respect and caution. One afternoon, after a particularly intense training session, Leon gathered a group in the common area to share another story. The mood was electric, a palpable excitement as students settled onto benches and cushions, eyes wide with anticipation. I think I'll tell you about the time I faced one of Earth's fiercest predators, Leon announced, grinning as he glanced at Chiral, who had become a steadfast ally. The Andros nodded, its eyes shimmering with curiosity. This predator was known as the Grizzly Bear, a massive creature, built like a tank and capable of running faster than any human. My friends and I went camping in a national park, eager to test our mettle in the wild. We were thrill-seekers, pushing boundaries without fully understanding the risks. As Leon recounted the story, the atmosphere grew tense, the listeners hanging on his every word. We set up our camp, ignorant of the signs of bear activity in the area. One night, we heard rustling outside our tent. My heart raced. I peeked out to see a hulking figure moving through the trees, a grizzly, drawn to the scent of our food. A shiver of fear ran through the crowd. Leon could see the Andros tensing, their instincts alert. In that moment, we had two choices, panic or act wisely. We panicked. We stumbled out of the tent, yelling and waving our arms, thinking we could scare it off. But the bear wasn't scared. It was curious and perhaps a bit annoyed. Did you get away? An Urkthal named Vrax asked, his voice thick with concern. Barely, Leon replied, leaning in as if to share a secret. In the chaos, I remembered what my father taught me about wildlife. Do not run and never show fear. I signaled to my friends to back away slowly, making ourselves look smaller. We didn't turn our backs on the bear, maintaining eye contact as we moved back toward the trees. Leon paused for effect, letting the tension build. The bear approached, sniffing the air, but eventually lost interest and lumbered away, perhaps more curious about our fire than anything else. That night, we learned a valuable lesson about respect for nature and each other. The crowd erupted in murmurs, some wide-eyed with astonishment, others exchanging glances as if testing the weight of his words. Cairo leaned forward, fascinated. You faced a creature that could have easily ended your life, and you chose understanding over fear. Exactly, Leon confirmed. That's what we do on Earth. We learn to navigate danger with intelligence and adaptability. It's about knowing when to fight and when to retreat. Surviving is not just a battle, it's a dance with nature. 
As Leon spoke, he could feel a subtle shift in the room, a deepening respect and a dawning realization that maybe there was more to humanity than just the raw stories of survival. His classmates were beginning to understand the layers of meaning beneath his tales. Later that evening, as the group began to disperse, Marlek approached Leon with a thoughtful expression. You really know how to weave a story, Leon. But do you ever worry that sharing these tales might give the wrong impression? Some of the younger students might think Earth is a place of chaos. Leon nodded, considering the point. I understand that concern, but I think it's important to show the full picture. Earth is chaotic, yes, but it's also beautiful. Our strength comes from facing that chaos and finding our way through it. Marlek crossed his arms, pondering. Maybe you could consider telling a different kind of story, something that showcases humanity's achievements, our creativity. Your planet has given birth to art, science, and innovation. What about those tales? Leon raised an eyebrow, intrigued by the idea. You mean like the Renaissance or the space program? Exactly, Marlek said, enthusiasm bubbling in his voice. Show us the side of humanity that builds, that creates, not just the one that fights and survives. With that suggestion, Leon felt a spark of inspiration. He realized that while his stories had centered around survival, there was indeed a wealth of experiences that showcased humanity's ingenuity and resilience. The next day, Leon returned to the library, diving into books and records about human innovation. He found himself lost in tales of great inventors, artists, and thinkers who had shaped not just Earth, but the universe. It was a treasure trove of narratives waiting to be told. That evening, he gathered his classmates again, this time with a new story in mind. As they settled in, he cleared his throat and began. Tonight, I'm going to tell you about one of humanity's greatest achievements, our journey to the stars. As Leon spoke, he painted vivid images of rockets blasting off, the triumph of landing on the moon, and the collective spirit that drove humanity to explore the cosmos. The students listened, captivated by the idea that Earth wasn't just a place of danger, but also a cradle of hope and discovery. When he finished, there was a moment of silence, and then applause erupted around him. The respect he had earned grew exponentially, transforming the perception of Earth from a land of monsters to a planet of creators. But amid the celebrations, Leon couldn't shake the feeling that there was still something lurking beneath the surface. As Rigel had suggested, his stories were sparking interest, perhaps too much interest. He couldn't help but wonder how far this fascination would go and what the implications would be. As the days turned to weeks, Leon found himself not just sharing tales, but shaping the narrative of humanity in a way he had never anticipated. And in doing so, he realized that his journey at the academy was about to take a turn he never expected. Leon stood before his classmates, the air thick with anticipation as they processed the chilling tale of the Iron Frost. He felt a rush of excitement. Their engagement fueled his passion for storytelling. But deep inside, he sensed that something significant was about to unfold something that would push him and his classmates to their limits. As the applause died down, a voice echoed from the back of the room. It was Mr. Hargrove, the Academy's lead instructor, his presence commanding immediate attention. Congratulations, Leon. Your storytelling has inspired your peers but I think it's time for a real test. A murmur of confusion rippled through the students. Leon's heart raced. What do you mean, Mr. Hargrove? We're going to simulate a death world survival scenario, Mr. Hargrove announced, a glint of excitement in his eyes. You'll be divided into teams and put through a series of challenges that replicate the harsh realities of Earth's most dangerous environments. The room erupted into a mix of cheers and gasps, Leon's mind raced as he processed the implications. This wasn't just a classroom exercise. It was a living nightmare, echoing the very tales he had been recounting. Leon, Mr. Hargrove continued, you'll lead one of the teams. Your experiences and stories will guide your classmates through this trial. Leon swallowed hard, a mix of pride and dread swirling in his gut. Of course, sir. I'll do my best. Good. You have 24 hours to prepare, Mr. Hargrove said, 
clapping his hands together. Now, let's get to work. As the students dispersed, Leon felt the weight of expectation settling on his shoulders. He gathered his classmates Tom, Jamie, and Raj, knowing they'd need to draw on their strengths to survive whatever the academy had planned. Okay, everyone, Leon said, his voice steady but filled with urgency. We've faced challenges in our stories, but this is different. We need to approach this with the mindset of survival. Do we know what kind of environment we'll be in? Jamie asked, her brow furrowed with concern. Not yet, Leon admitted, but we need to prepare for anything extreme cold, heat, rough terrain. We need to think like survivors. Raj, ever the skeptic, chimed in. And what if it's worse than we imagine? What if they throw real danger at us? That's precisely why we must stick together and use our skills, Leon replied. Remember the stories? Every survival scenario requires teamwork and quick thinking. We'll rely on each other, just like in the tales. With their spirits lifted, they gathered supplies, discussing strategies late into the night. They prepared themselves physically and mentally, recalling lessons from their previous experiences. As the clock ticked down, Leon felt a surge of determination. He would lead them through this test. The next day, they arrived at the Academy's outdoor training grounds, an expansive area designed to simulate various environments. As they approached, Leon's heart raced at the sight of rugged terrain, mock jungles, and even a frigid artificial tundra. This is it, he whispered, anticipation mingling with anxiety. Welcome to your trial, Mr. Hargrove announced, his voice booming over the students. You will face three distinct environments each with its own set of challenges. Your objective is to navigate through them and reach the final destination together. Leon rallied his team. Let's focus on communication and observation. We need to stay aware of our surroundings. The first environment they entered simulated a dense jungle, filled with towering trees and thick underbrush. The sounds of chirping birds and rustling leaves surrounded them. Stay alert for hazards both natural and artificial, Leon cautioned, recalling the dangers from his tales. As they ventured deeper, they faced their first challenge. A rickety bridge spanned a simulated ravine, creaking ominously. We need to cross, Leon said, studying the structure. Raj, you're our mountaineer. Check it for stability. Raj stepped onto the bridge, testing it carefully. It's shaky but holds. Let's move quickly. They crossed in quick succession, adrenaline pumping through their veins. Halfway across, a sudden crash echoed behind them. The bridge swayed dangerously, sending shivers down their spines. Run, Leon shouted, urging his teammates forward. They sprinted across just as the bridge gave way, plunging into the depths below. Heart pounding, Leon turned to see how close they had come to disaster. Next time, let's be more careful, Jamie exclaimed, breathless but exhilarated. The team pressed on, navigating through the dense foliage. They climbed steep hills, dodged low-hanging branches, and crossed a simulated river, relying on each other's strength. Leon led with confidence, drawing on the skills they had developed throughout their stories. As they emerged from the jungle, the environment shifted abruptly. They stood at the edge of a frozen wasteland, the air biting at their skin. The iron frost, Leon murmured, memories flooding back. Just like your story, Tom noted, awe in his eyes. Leon felt the gravity of their situation. This is where we need to be strategic. Stay close and conserve energy. They trudged through the snow, the cold seeping into their bones. Leon recalled how Elena had maintained morale in his tale, and he felt a surge of responsibility to do the same for his team. Remember, we're not just surviving, we're thriving together, he encouraged, his voice resolute. Look for landmarks to guide us. As they pushed through the biting winds, a series of loud howls echoed in the distance. Leon's heart raced. Stay together, it could be wolves. They pressed on, fear sharpening their senses. What's the plan? Jamie asked, panic flickering in her eyes. We'll set up camp for a moment and assess our surroundings, Leon decided. If we can find a structure for shelter, we can regroup and formulate our next steps. 
they stumbled upon a dilapidated cabin, similar to the one in Leon's tale. Inside, they quickly secured the door, panting from exertion. This is just like your story, Raj said, a grin breaking through the tension. I hope it doesn't turn into a nightmare. Leon chuckled, though unease settled in the pit of his stomach. Let's gather our resources and strategize. We need to watch each other's backs. As they huddled together, Leon shared snippets of the Iron Frost tale, using it to inspire and remind them of their resilience. But the howls outside grew louder, a chilling reminder that danger loomed. Suddenly, the cabin door rattled violently. The group exchanged fearful glances. They've found us, Tom shouted. Hold the door, Leon commanded, adrenaline surging. They braced themselves, pushing against the wooden frame. The howling intensified, and just when they thought the door would burst open, the sounds abruptly stopped. An eerie silence filled the air, broken only by the crackle of the wind. What happened? Jamie whispered, her voice trembling. I don't know, Leon admitted, his heart pounding. But we can't stay here. We need to move. With their nerves frayed, they exited the cabin cautiously. The tundra stretched before them, unforgiving and vast. Leon's mind raced with strategies. Let's head toward that ridge. We might find a better vantage point. As they navigated the treacherous terrain, Leon recalled how teamwork had saved the characters in his tales. We're stronger together, he reminded them, instilling a sense of purpose. As they climbed the ridge, they spotted a faint glimmer in the distance, another group of students. We're not alone, Jamie shouted, hope igniting in her voice. But as they drew closer, a chilling realization hit Leon. The other team was engaged in a struggle against the elements. They're caught in a blizzard, he exclaimed, instinctively urging his team forward. We have to help them, Raj shouted, determination etched on his face. Together, they descended toward the struggling team, rallying to assist. Keep moving, Leon shouted. Stay low and form a chain. As they helped the other team regain their footing, a sudden roar echoed through the tundra, a pack of wolves, larger and more aggressive than any imagined. Panic surged through Leon's veins. We need to retreat. The combined groups moved in unison, fear propelling them forward. They stumbled through the snow, adrenaline fueling their escape. The wolves closed in, snarling and snapping, their breath visible in the freezing air. Keep going, Leon urged, his heart racing as they sprinted for safety. Just as it seemed the wolves would catch up, Leon spotted an abandoned structure ahead, a weathered shack half buried in snow. There, he shouted, leading the charge toward the door. They piled inside, breathless and trembling, securing the door behind them. What now? Tom gasped, wide-eyed. We need to strategize, Leon said, trying to steady his racing heart. They're circling outside, but if we can find a way to distract them. Suddenly, the wolves began to howl again, their voices rising in an eerie symphony. They're calling for reinforcements, Jamie exclaimed, fear gripping her. Leon felt the weight of leadership pressing down on him. Listen, we can use our surroundings, if we can find something to create noise away from the door, we can lure them away. Like what? Raj asked, panic surfacing. Anything we can throw or use to make a sound, Leon said, scanning the room. Look for objects anything. They frantically rummaged through the shack, finally unearthing an old lantern and some rusted tools. This might work, Jamie shouted, holding up a heavy wrench. Perfect, Leon replied. Let's throw them in the opposite direction. We'll create a diversion. As they prepared, the howls grew louder outside. Now or never, Leon shouted, adrenaline surging. They opened the door just enough to hurl the lantern and tools into the snow, sending them clattering away from their hiding place. The wolves, intrigued by the noise, turned to investigate. Go, go, Leon urged, leading the charge as they sprinted from the shack adrenaline pushing them to their limits. They ran, hearts pounding, escaping into the swirling snow as the wolves lost interest. We did it, Tom shouted, relief flooding through him. But Leon knew the journey was far from over. 
We need to regroup and get to the final challenge, he urged, scanning the horizon for signs of the last environment. After a grueling trek through the tundra, they finally approached the last area, a simulated volcanic landscape. The ground shook beneath their feet and steam billowed from fissures. Welcome to the finale, Leon said, stealing himself. Just like the volcanic tales, Jamie exclaimed, excitement mingling with fear. This is where we'll put everything we've learned to the test, Leon said. Stay sharp and remember, we're here to survive. As they navigated the rocky terrain, they encountered their final challenge, a series of obstacles meant to test their endurance and teamwork. We need to climb that ridge and cross the lava flow, Leon directed. With each step, the heat intensified and the ground beneath them felt alive. They faced simulated eruptions, dodging molten debris and navigating treacherous pathways. Leon felt the pressure mounting, but his confidence in his team steadied him. Keep moving, he shouted, rallying them forward. We can't lose focus now. At last, they reached the final checkpoint, exhausted but victorious. We did it, Raj exclaimed, pumping his fist in triumph. Mr. Hargrove approached, a proud smile on his face. Congratulations, you've successfully completed the Death World survival scenario. Leon felt a rush of elation, but beneath it lay an awareness of how close they had come to true danger. This was incredible, he said, looking at his teammates. We survived together, just like in the stories. As the adrenaline faded, Leon gathered everyone together. This experience showed us that survival isn't just about the environment, it's about the connections we forge. Our stories reflect the challenges we face, but it's our unity that ultimately allows us to thrive. The students cheered, their camaraderie evident. Leon had led them through a real-life test of survival, echoing the very tales he had shared. As they walked back to the academy, he felt a profound sense of accomplishment. In that moment, Leon understood that the stories of humanity were not just terrifying fiction, they were the essence of their reality. Through adversity, they had emerged stronger, more resilient, and ready to face whatever lay ahead. And as they stepped into the warmth of the academy, Leon realized that the greatest tale was yet to be written one of courage, unity, and the indomitable spirit of humanity. The academy had become a second home for Leon, a place where his stories wove connections between disparate cultures. However, with that sense of belonging came an unsettling tension. Whispers filled the corridors, rumors spreading about Earth and its inhabitants. Leon was no longer just a student. He was a representative of humanity, a beacon of curiosity that attracted both admiration and skepticism. One afternoon, while preparing for another storytelling session, Leon found himself in the training room. The atmosphere buzzed with energy as students sparred and practiced various combat techniques. As he watched, he couldn't help but feel the weight of expectation. His stories had inspired many, but had they also unwittingly provoked a thirst for conquest? Chiral approached him, concern etched on its face. Leon, have you noticed the shift in the academy? Some students are no longer merely interested in your tales. They see them as challenges. They want to test their strength against the terrifying humans you speak of. What do you mean? Leon replied, frowning. You think they're looking for a fight? Cairo nodded gravely. It's not just curiosity anymore. It's pride. Some feel that to truly understand humanity, they must confront it. They want to prove themselves against the death world student and his stories. Leon's heart raced. He hadn't intended for his narratives to incite competition or aggression. That's not what I want at all. My stories are about resilience, not conflict. Perhaps, but perceptions have a way of twisting intentions, Chiral said, glancing around the training area. You must address this before it spirals out of control. Leon thought for a moment, determination settling in. Then I'll confront it head on. I'll use my next story to clarify that strength lies not just in combat, but in understanding. That evening, as students gathered for his session, Leon felt a mix of anticipation and dread. He took a deep breath, scanning the crowd. Some students were eager, eyes glinting with competitive fire, 
while others seemed genuinely curious. Tonight, he began, his voice steady, I want to share a story that goes beyond battles and monsters. It's about a time when humanity faced not an enemy, but a profound challenge one that tested our minds and hearts. He launched into the tale of the Apollo 13 mission, a true story that had become legendary on Earth. In 1970, three astronauts were en route to the moon when an oxygen tank exploded, leaving them stranded in space. With limited resources and time running out, they had to work together to survive. As he described the crew's ingenuity, the tense decisions, and the desperate calculations, Leon saw the audience's expression shift. The competitive energy dulled, replaced by rapt attention. They relied on the knowledge of thousands on Earth, pooling expertise from engineers to scientists. It wasn't just about individual strength. It was about collaboration, creativity, and the indomitable human spirit. He could feel the weight of his words sinking in, driving home the message he intended. In the end, they didn't just survive. They triumphed against all odds, returning home safely. This story isn't just about bravery. It's about resilience in the face of insurmountable challenges, about how we unite in times of crisis. As he concluded, the silence in the room was palpable. He had captured their attention, not through tales of violence, but by highlighting humanity's capacity for problem-solving and cooperation. Finally, Cairo stood and clapped, breaking the stillness. One by one, others joined in, and the applause grew louder. Leon felt a surge of relief wash over him. He had managed to redirect the narrative away from conflict and towards understanding. But even as the crowd cheered, Leon couldn't shake the feeling that this was merely a temporary reprieve. There was still an undercurrent of tension lingering at the academy, and he sensed it would resurface. Over the next few days, Leon kept a watchful eye on his peers. The initial excitement had transformed into a cautious camaraderie, but cracks began to appear. Some students, still fueled by pride, sought out individual challenges. Rigel, who had been mostly silent, finally approached Leon again. I'm afraid this isn't over, Rigel admitted, his tone serious. While your story resonated, there are still those who view it as a rallying call. They see it as an opportunity to prove themselves against the human student who tells tales of survival. Leon felt a knot form in his stomach. What can we do? Rigel thought for a moment. Perhaps you should organize a demonstration, a friendly competition of sorts. It could highlight the strengths of various races while showcasing your own abilities. This way, you could shift their perception make them see that it's not about conquering each other, but about learning and sharing. Leon mulled over the suggestion. A demonstration could work, but how do we ensure it doesn't devolve into something hostile? Set clear rules, a framework for respect and cooperation, Rigel advised. Make it clear that this is about understanding, not domination. With that plan in mind, Leon set to work organizing the event. He reached out to various student groups, explaining his vision of a friendly competition that celebrated the unique strengths of each race while fostering understanding among them. To his surprise, the response was overwhelmingly positive, with many students eager to participate. Finally, the day of the demonstration arrived. The Academy's central arena was transformed into an elaborate battleground, with areas designated for different skills, combat, strategy games, and problem-solving challenges. Banners from each race decorated the arena, a colorful tapestry of cultures united by curiosity. As students began to arrive, Leon felt a mixture of excitement and nerves. He stood at the center, flanked by Chiral and Rigel, ready to welcome the crowd. Welcome, everyone. Today is about celebrating our differences and finding common ground. Let's show what we can accomplish together. Cheers erupted and the atmosphere shifted as the students broke into teams, eager to showcase their skills. The first event, a strategic game that combined elements of puzzle solving and teamwork proved to be a hit. Students quickly learned to communicate, share ideas, and devise plans that utilized each member's unique strengths. As the competition continued, Leon noticed a palpable change in the air. The camaraderie that had once felt strained began to flourish, 
students were laughing, sharing stories, and celebrating each other's successes, transcending the barriers that had once divided them. By the time the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, the demonstration had morphed into a vibrant festival of unity. Leon stepped back, watching as students mingled, trading tales from their respective worlds. It was a beautiful sight, one that echoed the very essence of what he had hoped to achieve. In the heart of the festivities, Leon felt a surge of gratitude. He had not only managed to reshape the narrative surrounding humanity, but he had also helped foster understanding and respect among the Academy's diverse inhabitants. The whispers of competition had faded, replaced by a chorus of laughter and shared experiences.